Hey guys, it is um, March 31st. I'm filming your video for tomorrow, April 1st, on mole conversions. Um, I wish I had an April Fool's joke for you, but I don't. Um, believe me, this assignment is not a joke. Uh, this is serious. And um, more importantly, I hope you're all doing well on the other side of this video out there. Um, if you have any questions, concerns, comments, feel free to send them my way. I do have a lot to cover today, and I'll try to get through it as fast as possible. Uh, I'm going to start off with just a little housekeeping. Um, as you hopefully read on Sunday night, uh, I restructured the workflow based off of your feedback from the survey. Um, and to get on schedule, that meant there was no assignment on Monday. So if you're wondering why didn't I have an assignment on Monday, um, that's because I, I was trying to catch up myself. Um, and I did, I will admit, get a little overwhelmed last week. So I'm hoping this new schedule will help um, both you and me um, feel like the workload is reasonable. Um, so just so we're clear, um, this schedule creates two assignments a week. Typically, there will be a Monday assignment. Um, there will be a Wednesday assignment. The Monday assignment will be typically due that next Wednesday. And the Wednesday assignment, which you're getting today, will be due the following Monday, the Monday of the next week. Um, so that was one piece of feedback from the survey was to, you know, let's pare down the number of assignments. Um, they might end up a little bit longer as a result of that, but for today's assignment, um, for example, you have Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday to get it done. So um, do your best with it. And then another piece of feedback was it would be nice to have some Google Hangouts available to us. Um, I'm not going to mandate these. I do like the idea of having the, the primary instruction be pre-recorded so that you can jump around in the YouTube videos as you need to. Um, but I understand uh, the importance of in real time feedback. So on the other side of these links, there are optional Google Hangouts. Um, my idea behind this is say you get this assignment today on Wednesday. You take a look at it and you have some questions. You can come into this Google Hangout tomorrow on Thursday, and that does um, that does match up with the school, the general school schedule as well. And hopefully, you'll get your questions answered there, so you can complete the assignment before it's due. Same with Monday. If you get the Monday assignment, you can come into the Tuesday Google Hangout and get your questions answered, so you can get it done by Wednesday. Um, anyways, I'm going to pop into one of those. Hangouts real quick, um, just so we're clear on this. Again, this documents in Schoology. I sent it to you in your email. Um, this right here is a link, and if you click that link, it brings you to the IS Extend Google Hangout room. Um, the Open Office Hours is a different one. IS Explorer has one. My TA has one. So if you click on this link, you come into during this time on this day, you come into the Integrated Science. Extend chat room, and I just want to show you what will probably happen is, yeah, and I'll be doing work during that time, planning, grading, um, with my mic and my camera off. Um, and then when I hear that noise that someone's appeared, um, I will turn my mic and my camera back on. We can chat. I can answer any questions you have. Um, and then... Uh, you can sign off when you're feeling good about things. Um, I hope that makes sense. Um, certainly an optional chat room, it's not required. Um, and feel free to kind of um, match up with your friends and come in at the same time if you want. Um, and in addition to that, there are a bunch of office hours where you can show up, especially on Friday, which is kind of a hopefully a catch up day for everyone. Lots of office hours. All right. Um, back to the presentation. Um, <clears throat> one last thing I'd throw out there is uh, there was a piece of feedback in the survey that said, wouldn't it be nice if we could have the whole week's worth of curriculum on, say, Sunday night? Um, I hear that, and it would be nice. I would love that, too. Um, I made a weekly schedule for myself, and that weekly schedule has me doing things literally the day before just by the nature of this change. Um, so I can't meet that piece of feedback. Um, I understand it. It's reasonable. But right now I'm 
one step ahead of you guys. So bear with me. I'm hoping after a few Fridays go by, I can get caught up and maybe we are getting the whole week on Sunday. Um, but right now it's just out of the cards. In addition to that, um, I've found that with um, being home all day, every day, it's been really helpful to have a schedule. Um, as you can see, if you notice the clock at the beginning of the video, I'm way off schedule because I did not film this video at 9.45. It's like 7.30 at night right now. Um, but the schedule does help, and so I would encourage you all to make schedules and, um, and write to-do list. Those are two strategies that I've found have been very helpful with getting through this. Um, I will say uh, a shout out to Gus and Anna because they did show up in the chat room today. They were the only two. Um, so well done. The chat rooms do work. We didn't actually talk about science at all, but we got to hang out. They got to watch me cook breakfast. Um, and with that said, when we're in the chat rooms, so let's just make sure we, uh, we keep it friendly, guys. I don't know what that's all about, Gus. All right. Now we're going to get into the chemistry. We've got a learning objective here. Uh, and that learning objective is I can calculate, so we're going to be doing some math, the moles, number of atoms or molecules, and the grams of a given substance. And how this game will work, this game that I call mole conversions, is I'll give you one quantity, say the number of moles, and you have to calculate the grams. I'll give you the number of atoms, and you calculate the moles. Um, so hopefully we're able to move between these three different types, how heavy something is, how many there are of something, and then this counting unit unit that plays the bridge. Um, hopefully, we'll be able to move all three of those between all three of those by the end of this. All right. So, just a quick refresher on the mole. Recall that the mole, um, which is abbreviated MOL, you only lose one letter, but that is the abbreviation, is a counting unit, just like a dozen. And one mole is equal to 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms or molecules of a substance. And we call that Avogadro's number. And then lastly, the molar mass of a substance, which is found using the periodic table. Um, and hopefully you got some practice with that last week. My goal is to be grading those tomorrow so that you know if you're finding the correct molar masses before you start this new assignment. But the molar mass of a substance found using the periodic table tells us how much one mole of that substance weighs in grams. All right, so I'm going to go through a quick metaphor before we jump into it. Um, I have a bag of chocolate chips here. I actually do have a bag of chocolate chips here. It's a pretty big bag, all house. And I want to know how many chocolate chips are in the bag. I want to count them. But here's the kicker. It's a large bag. It is a very large bag. And I do not have the time to count all these chocolate chips. And so my question to you is, what could I do to count these quickly without actually counting them? That is very important to chemists because chemists cannot count atoms and molecules, and yet they need to know how many are there. Um, so we're going to apply in a more uh, tangible sense what the mole is actually like. So this is an important piece. Chocolate chips are relatively uniform. They're all about the same, similar to atoms of a certain element or uh, molecules of a certain compound. They're all relatively uniform. And so what I can do, the process I'm about to go through, is I can take a sample of chocolate chips, say 10, and I've got them right here. I can take 10 chocolate chips in my hand, and I can throw them on the scale and weigh the 10, and then I can use the weight on the bag, which this is 2.04 kilograms or 2,040 grams, and I can use that information to find the total number of chocolate chips. So let's see how it's going to work out. Here's the metaphor continued. Uh, using the scale, I found that 10 chocolate chips equals 3.5 grams. The entire bag of chocolate chips is 2,040 grams. I got that right off of the label. And so how many chocolate chips are in the bag? There is enough information here to solve this. Um, it's going to start like this. I'm going to start with the given information that I have, the 2,040 grams. That's my starting point. So I'm going to write that out, and then I'm going to take this equality, this um, equation that says 10 chocolate chips equals 3.5 grams, and I'm going to turn it into a ratio, and that ratio will allow me to cancel out the unit of grams and get into the unit of chocolate chips. 
So that's how it's going to look. I put grams in the denominator because grams over grams are what cancels out. And then chocolate chips is the thing I want to get to, so that's why it ended up in the numerator. We're going to do some more examples with this, but once my units are set up in that conversion factor, in that fraction, then my numbers just follow the units. So the 10 was tied to the chocolate chips, so it followed the, the 10 followed down to the numerator where chocolate chips was, and the 3.5 was tied to the grams, so that's why it ended up in the denominator. Now, I've got a math problem here, and you might be wondering, well, how, how would I actually go about solving this? Um, here's what I would type in the calculator. I would do 2040 times 10, um, because it's in the numer numerator, so multiplying across the top, and then divided by 3.5. And when I punch that in the calculator, here's what I get. In this bag of chocolate chips that weighs 2,040 grams, According to this, this data, there's 5,828.57 chocolate chips. Now, um, there's a philosophical debate about if you can have 0.57 of a chocolate chip, or if at that point it's no longer a chip. Um, there is some, some rounding in here that happens because of this method. Um, so we're between 5,828 and 5,829 chocolate chips. Um, I would actually have to take the half an hour or hour to count all those out to see how accurate I was, but hopefully this method makes sense of a way to essentially count by weighing, which is exactly what chemists do with the mole. They weigh things and then use that to determine the quantity of atoms and molecules instead of um, just operating on the weight. All right, and so one thing I just barely did is called dimensional analysis. So what I just did is called dimensional analysis. It's a systematic way of converting units using what are called conversion factors. And it's a chemist's biggest tool by far. So it's important that we start to practice this now because it'll come up more and more as we go through these next few weeks. Um, in that, I use the word conversion factor. You might wonder what that is. A conversion factor is a ratio that accurately relates two units and is used to cancel a given unit. In the last case, I canceled the unit of grams and arrive at a desired unit, like chocolate chips. Here's another example. Um, let's say I want to convert 24 inches into feet. Um, my starting amount would be 24 inches. And then I'm going to make a conversion factor where the unit I want to cancel is in the denominator, inches. And the unit I want to get to is in the numerator feet, and then I ask myself well, how many feet are in an inch, um, or how many inches are in a feet, might be a more logical way of say, stating that. And, and I let the numbers follow the units. So there's 12 inches per one foot. Again, it's important to recognize that inches go in the denominator, so the inches over inches cancel out. And of course, 24 divided by two, or excuse me, 24 divided by 12 is two feet. So, I can have any, any conversion factor like one foot equals 12 inches, and starting from inequality, like A equals B, a conversion factor can be written two ways. You could write A over B or B over A. You could put one unit in the numerator or you could put the other unit in the numerator. And the one you choose in your problem depends on what your starting unit is and what your ending unit is. Your starting unit that you're given in the problem is the thing you want to cancel and therefore it should be in the denominator. Your ending unit, the thing you want to get to, um, should be in the numerator. So in this case, my starting unit was inches, and so that's why inches ended up in the denominator. My ending unit was feet, and that's why feet ended up in the numerator. So if I had the, the equality, one foot equals 12 inches, I could write it one feet per 12 inches, or 12 inches per one feet. And in this case, I took one foot per 12 inches. So at that, uh, I'm not quite done with the slides, but I do want to pop out. And I'm just going to do a simple example once, once more about what dimensional analysis is at the whiteboard, where we convert my height of 5.67 feet into miles, because maybe I want to know how tall I am in miles. And at that, we will go to the whiteboard. All right, guys, we are going to do a, an example 
um, of dimensional analysis that actually does not yet involve chemistry. We're just going to do some simple unit conversion here. I want to take my height of 5.67 feet and I want to try to convert that into miles. Um, so how I would start this, the very first step, is I would ask myself, what is my starting information? 5.67 feet, that's my starting. Um, then I'd ask myself, what is my desired or my, my end unit? Um, miles is my end. And so I want to set a road map where I go 5.67 feet into miles. And now I need a conversion factor. I need to ask myself, well, what do I know about feet and miles? Uh, you could look this up, or maybe you know this off the top of your head, but one mile equals 5,280 feet. So from this, I can write this conversion factor two ways. I can write 5,280 feet per one mile, or I could write it as the reciprocal, one mile per 5,280 feet. Um, what I choose, this one or this one, is dependent on where I'm starting and where I want to go. So, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to write out my starting information, 5.67 uh, uh, feet. And then dimensional analysis is all about multiplying by fractions. So I'm going to multiply by a fraction, a ratio. And I see that feet is the unit I'm starting in, and therefore feet is the thing I want to cancel out. And so I'm going to put feet down here in the denominator, because feet over feet do just that. They cancel out. And the thing I want to get to, the unit I want to get to, I put in the numerator, miles. And so now that I've got my units in the right place, feet cancel out and I'm left in the unit of miles, I can grab my numbers and let them follow my units. So miles was in the numerator, so the one is going in the numerator. 5,280 is uh, the number with feet, so that's going in the denominator. And I've set up my problem. Um, if I were to enter this into a calculator, what I would do is 5.8. 6, 7 times 1, which really you can ignore the 1's because anything times 1 is itself. So 5.67 divided by 5,280 feet. That's kind of the math I would do here. 5.67 times 1, but I'm going to ignore that, divided by 5,280. Again, ignoring the 1, I'm left with just 5.67 divided by 5,280. And when I do that out, I'm going to get an answer of 0 0.001 0 0 7 miles which makes sense to me, it's a really small number because um, I'm not that tall and I'm certainly not that tall in miles, which is a really large unit. Um, so I'm about one thousandth of a mile tall. Uh, and that was just an example, um, before we jump into the chemistry, of how you should do dimensional analysis. Find your starting unit, find your end unit, make a road map, write out your equality for your two units, this equals that and then turn it into two conversion factors. Pick the conversion factor that lets you cancel the starting unit and get to the end unit, do the math, and then you've got your answer. Hey guys, we're back in the computer now. I hope that example of dimensional analysis um, without any of the chemistry was helpful, going from feet to miles. Um, now we are gonna try to do dimensional analysis with the chemistry. Um, and so the first type of problem that you might see is converting between moles and particles. By particles, I mean um, microscopic particles like atoms or molecules. So the conversion factor that allows us to go from moles to microscopic particles or vice versa. Um, when it comes to elements, we'd say the microscopic particles are atoms. When it comes to compounds, we are, we'd say they're molecules. That conversion factor is made from Avogadro's number. 
Now, Avogadro's number, of course, is one mole equals 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd particles, atoms or molecules. So from that equation, that equality, we can write two fractions. I could write 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd particles divided by one mole, or I could write one mole divided by 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd particles. So we just saw which one you pick is dependent on which unit you're starting with and which unit you want to get to. So over here, I have this graphic, which um, I'm a little hesitant to share with you, but I'm sharing it anyways. Um, I'm hesitant because I don't want this to become a crutch down the road. Dimensional analysis will get harder both in this course and once you get to uh, chemistry with the Schuster. And so it's important you practice the dimensional analysis now, um, but this graphic can be really helpful as you get going. So what this is telling us is basically the calculation, what you need to punch in the calculator um, to get the right answer. And let's think about this. If I'm in the unit of moles, and I want to get to the unit of particles, then which conversion factor would I choose? I would choose the top one because moles is in the denominator, it would cancel out, and the unit I want to get to is particles, it's left in the numerator. And we said in that last example that we can ignore the one. So the net effect of going from moles to particles is taking however many moles you have and just multiplying by Avogadro's number, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. Conversely, if I'm in particles and I want to get to moles, then what I would need to do there is choose this bottom one. And again, if I'm ignoring the one, then ultimately the mathematics become whatever number of particles I'm given to start with divided by Avogadro's number gets me to moles. Here's just one example of that written out from the dimensional analysis perspective. This question might read, how many atoms of xenon are in 3.91 moles of xenon, and you can see they took that starting amount, 3.91 moles of xenon, they took the correct conversion factor using Avogadro's number that cancels out moles of xenon and puts them into atoms, and when you do the math, you get 2.35 times 10 to the 24th atoms of xenon. All right, the next type of problem that you might see is converting between moles and grams. Now, the conversion factor that allows us to convert between moles and grams of a substance is the substance's molar mass. Um, here's an example with aluminum. You look on the periodic table. That's where you find molar masses. Um, one mole of aluminum is equal to 26.98 grams of aluminum. That comes right from the periodic table. So I can write that as a conversion factor two separate ways. 26.98 grams over one mole or one mole over 26.98 grams. Now let's say I wanted to take some number of uh, grams of some substance and I wanted to convert it into moles. Again, using this schematic, um, if I'm starting in mass in grams, then I would want to choose this conversion factor because the grams would cancel out and the grams from your starting amount with the grams in the conversion factor and the desired unit that I want to get to is moles. And so the, the net effect of that, if I'm ignoring the one, is really you take that starting amount of grams and you divide by the molar mass. Conversely, if I'm in moles and I want to get to mass, what I would need to do is take um, that number of moles and choose this conversion factor where moles would cancel out and I'm left in the unit of grams. And if I'm ignoring the one again, really what I'm doing is I'm taking the number of moles and I'm multiplying by the molar mass to get into grams. Here's just a quick example of that. Um, what I like about this one is it uses a compound, uh, sodium hydroxide, NaOH. So don't forget that the first thing I would need to do here is find the molar mass of sodium hydroxide. Um, so that's done out over here real quick. Um, depending on how much rounding you use, um, the people here used a different amount of um, decimal points as the people here. Um, so these numbers are close but not identical. You're, you might get different answers. When someone asked me on the street, what's the molar mass of sodium hydroxide, I would probably just say 40 um, because I'd round hydrogen to one. But anyways, I digress. Um, one sodium atom at 23 plus one oxygen atom at 16 plus one hydrogen atom at one or 1.01 gives us a molar mass of 40.01 grams per one mole. And so now if I was given a question that might read, how many grams of sodium hydroxide 
are in 3.87 moles sodium hydroxide, what I would do is take that starting amount, 3.87 moles sodium hydroxide, and I would multiply by that molar mass I just got that had moles in the denominator and grams in the numerator. And when I do that, um, moles would cancel out, and I'm left in the unit of grams. And if you did this math on a calculator, 3.87 times that highly precise molar mass, 39.997, you'd end up getting an answer of 155 grams sodium hydroxide and 3.87 moles sodium hydroxide. Um, I put those two conversion charts together, and this is what I get. So this could be a helpful resource as you go through the problem set especially some in PD where I might ask you to go from mass all the way through to particles and think about how you'd have to do that. That is a, what I would call a two-stepper. It's going to involve dividing by the molar mass and then multiplying by Avogadro's number. Lastly, I'll just share with you some PD level conversion factors. Um, the first one is that subscripts in a chemical formula, like the 2 and H2O, allow you to convert between molecules and atoms of an element. An example would be 1CH4 equals 4 hydrogen atoms. There's 1CH4 molecule per 4 hydrogen atoms. The density of an object allows you to convert between mass, which is often given in grams, and volume, often given in milliliters or liters. So here's an example. The density of ethanol is 0 0.789 grams per milliliter. So I can say 0 0.789 grams equals one milliliter of ethanol. And lastly, this is just a commonly remembered constant in chemistry. One mole of a gas at zero degrees Celsius in the pressure of the atmosphere, we call that standard temperature and pressure, or STP. One mole of a gas has a volume of 22.4 liters. So you could make a conversion factor from the equality one mole CO2 equals 22.4 liters CO2. Again, that only applies for the phase of matter that is gaseous, not liquids and solids. And at that, I'm going to go into some examples for you all to watch and then um, do the best you can with the problem set. Come to the, the Hangout tomorrow if you have questions. Um, it might be challenging, but you guys got this. All right, so now I'm going to uh, apply the technique of dimensional analysis to some chemistry-specific problems. Uh, the list of problems I'm going to be doing is available in your problem set. It comes right before the proficient section where your questions turn to being quantitative. Um, and this is meant to just help you um, see the process that you should try to be doing once you get into that proficient section or the PD section if you want to challenge yourself for that. So the very first one I'm going to do is how many atoms of iron, Fe, are in 2.3 moles of Fe? And like we talked about in the um, feet to mile example, I'm going to start by finding my starting unit. Um, 2.3 moles iron is my starting unit. I'm going to find my ending unit. That would be atoms of iron is what I want to get to. And then I'm going to ask myself, well, what do I know about moles and atoms? Moles and atoms are related through Avogadro's number. One mole of anything equals 2.3... Sorry. One mole of anything equals 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of that thing. I chose atoms because iron is just an element. If I was talking about a compound, I would put molecules there. Um, but this is Avogadro's number written out as an equality. And now I'm going to take my starting unit, 2.3. You know, oops, always good. I almost, almost uh, made a, a fundamental mistake there. It's always good to write your unit in. 2.3 moles, that's my starting unit, times and now moles is the thing I want to cancel, so I'm going to put moles in the denominator. Um, atoms is the thing I want to get to, so I'm going to put atoms in the numerator. And then from my equality, I'm letting the numbers follow the units. One mole 
one is tied to moles, so one goes in the denominator, equals 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms. Remember, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, two of those 23 moves go to getting the decimal point past the two, and then there's 21 zeros after that. So this is a really large number. Um, but hopefully with this you can see the setup where moles will cancel out and I'm left in the unit of atoms. And really all I have to do here is 2.3 times 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. That's the math I would actually type in the calculator and let's see what we get. I would be cautious about um, how you enter this number in, uh, and maybe it would be good for you to try on your calculator right now um, to do this math, because the scientific notation on certain calculators can be tricky. Um, I find them especially tricky on the iPhone calculator, and so that might be something we can talk about in the Google Hangout tomorrow, um, but do be careful about how you enter this number in. Uh, and what I get in the end is 1.3846 times 10 to the 24th atoms. Um, that number makes sense to me. Uh, times 10 to the 23rd is a big number, but times 10 to the 24th is even bigger. Uh, and it's bigger because I've multiplied it by 2.3. So this number is 2.3 times larger than that number. Uh, and that was our first example, and we go on to the next one. All right, here we are at the next one. This question is, how many moles of water, H2O, are in 9.0 times 10 to the 24th molecules of water? So I give you a huge number of molecules, and I ask you to convert them back to moles here. Um, I do expect, just as kind of a, a way I would think about this before you even get going, I do expect my number to be greater than 1, because if this number right here was 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules, then my answer would be 1. Um, but I have a number bigger than 1, so I'm expecting um, a starting number bigger than 1, so I'm expecting an answer bigger than 1. Um, and with that said, we're going to jump right into it. Uh, my starting unit here is now molecules of water, specifically 9.0 times 10 to the 24th. My um, desired unit that I want to get to in the end is moles of water. That's my end. Um, and I'm going to make a, a quick little road map. I want to go from 9.0 times 10 to the 24th molecules into moles. And I know that molecules and moles are related by Avogadro's number. One mole equals 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules. And so I'm going to set this up as I've been doing. I'm going to write out my starting number. 9.0 times 10 to the 24th uh, molecules. And I'm going to multiply by a fraction. And the unit I want in the denominator is my starting unit. Molecules goes down here. And that means that molecules cancels out with molecules. And the unit I want to get to is moles. So moles goes up here. And now I just let my numbers follow my units. One is tied to the mole. So then this time, which is opposite the last time, the one goes in the numerator. And... The 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd is tied to the molecules, so that goes in the denominator. And here's the, the math I would put in here. Again, I can ignore the 1, because anything times 1 is itself. So really all I'm doing here is 9 times 10 to the 24th divided by 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. But this might be tricky because both of these numbers are in scientific notation. So again, I'm just going to caution you to be really careful about what app or what 
um, calculator you're using um, and maybe try this right now and make sure you're getting the right answer. And if you have any questions about just how to enter these numbers into calculators, please come to the Google Hangout tomorrow. Um, but here's the math I would do. This one very large number divided by this other very large number. Um, and I'm actually going to turn to Google for this one. I think they have a pretty easy way of entering scientific notation. Happy to show it to you tomorrow. And the answer I get here from Google is 14.95 moles. So if I have that many molecules of water, 9.0 times 10 to the 24th molecules of water, then that means I have 14.95 moles of water. And we're going to do one more example for you. All right, here's the last example I'm going to do for you. I wanted to do this one because it involves the molar mass. Um, I'm going to start how I've been starting. I'm going to ask, what is my starting unit? 56 grams of carbon dioxide is where I'm starting in this problem. Let me read the problem. How many moles of CO2 are in 56 grams of CO2? So I'm starting at 56 grams of CO2, and I want to get to moles of CO2, so that's my ending unit. Um, right away I recognize that if my map is 56 grams CO2 to moles CO2, this conversion, this conversion involves grams. So I need to find the molar mass of carbon dioxide. So I'm going to do that quickly off to the side here. The molar mass of CO2 goes like this. Carbon has a mass of 12. You could check it on your periodic table. I'm rounding a little bit there. Oxygen has a mass of 16. And in this particular formula, I have two oxygens, so I need to double that 16. So that means the one carbon at 12, the two oxygen at 16 is 32. 32 plus 12 gives me a total molar mass of 44 grams per mole. So I've found my molar mass for carbon dioxide. If if the, um, the problem involves grams, that, that will be a starting point for you, is to figure out how many grams does one mole of that substance weigh. It won't always be 44, it's dependent on the chemical formula of the substance. Um, and now the next thing I can do is I can write out that molar mass as an equality for carbon dioxide, one mole CO2 equals 44 grams CO2. And then I'm going to take my starting amount, 56 grams CO2. I'm multiplying by a fraction like I've been doing. And in this fraction, grams is the unit I want to cancel. It's my starting unit. And so it must go in the denominator. I put it in the denominator. Grams over grams cancel out. Moles is the unit I want to get to, my ending unit. So it goes in the numerator. And then I can't stress this enough. You you set up your units first, and then you let your numbers follow your units. So here, 1 is tied to mole, so 1 ends up in the numerator. 44 is tied to grams, so 44 ends up in the denominator. When I look at this, I can ignore the mole, excuse me, ignore the 1, and so I can do, essentially in the calculator, 56 divided by 44. They're on opposite sides of the division line, so my input into the calculator is 56 divided by 44. And I get 1.27 with some rounding. So my final answer is 1.27 moles. If I have 56 grams of carbon dioxide, I have 1.27 moles. Um, I know that this unit, this, this assignment is a lot, so please don't get discouraged. Um, the PD 
questions might be very challenging. Um, the P questions are going to be very similar to this, and, and I'm not trying to belittle it. This is in and of itself quite a bit. Um, so ask questions as you need them, um, and feel free to search the internet for mole conversions, videos, um, readings, worksheets, example problems. There's all sorts of information out there about mole conversions, and I, I cannot say this enough. This is one of the most fundamental skills to a chemist, and when you get in chemistry next year or the year after, you will be doing this a lot, so it's good to practice it now. And at that, I hope you all are well and stay well. Um, keep vibing.